Hey YouTube, it's Dwayne here. So I got another guest with me today. We are continuing our discussion about the Textus Receptus. And today we're fortunate enough to have Dr. Peter Van Cleek with us today. Dr. Van Cleek, could you go ahead and say hello? Hey, thanks for having me on. I stirred the pot a little bit, not on purpose, <laughs> but I stirred the pot a little bit and uh, had Dr. Riddle come on the channel. And we had a discussion about the Texas Receptus and confessional bibliology, which I found to be a rather fascinating conversation. But I was still left with the question of which TR. So I made a little video response about that and, and some of my thoughts. Now, I'll put a link here or a card right there. There we go. And you can go check that out after you're done watching this one, or you can pause it and go watch that. I wanted to bring you on the channel to discuss that specific question, which TR. Why don't you go ahead and, and tell us what you think about the which TR question. The emphasis or the argument that I make uh, is on the, the nature of the argument. Uh, we can certainly ask the question, but the method that we go about carrying on the argument has to be, I think, needs to be delineated. And so what we're often faced with, with, with really any question about which DR or which version, we are faced with a question that is often rationalistic in one way and more often than not evidentially based. What, what I would challenge, if there's one thing I could challenge your listeners to, is to challenge them to see their belief in the Bible as no different than any of the other beliefs that they maintain. How is it, and we just ask this question, how is it that you believe in the resurrection? How is it that you believe in Lazarus' resurrection? How is it that you believe in the parting of the Red Sea or uh, that manna fell from heaven for the Israelites? How is it that you come to believe those things? And then I would ask, once we had worked through your, your epistemic foundation, I would then ask, why don't we then treat our belief about the Bible that way? Right. And so that is where I would want to begin. I would begin, if we're going to ask the question of which TR, we can ask the question from an evidential perspective, which is to take the evidence that we have, to take the witnesses that we have, to take the archaeology that we have, and build a cogent argument, and from that argument, draw a conclusion about a particular Greek text or a combination right, of a Greek text. The way that I, again, would want to challenge people to see this from this perspective is from a distinctly Christian epistemic foundation. And to treat your belief in the Bible, and in this case, your belief in the TR, as you would treat any other Christian belief. And then just to kind of, to offer the other side, it would be, if you don't believe that your belief in the Bible should be treated like any other Christian belief, then I believe the burden of proof rests with that person to show positively why belief in the Bible is in some way a different kind or a different species of belief than the beliefs that I've mentioned. So uh, my positive argument would be treat the Bible like you treat any other belief or your belief in the Bible like any other belief. If you don't believe that the Bible should be uh, treated like that, then I believe the burden of proof rests with you to offer a positive argument as to why belief in the Bible is a different kind or a different species of belief than it is, say, in the resurrection of Lazarus. So when, when you talk about us believing in, uh, like, how we come to believe something, like, I, I'm, I'm a Christian for no other reason that the Holy Spirit drew me in and, and God say, God's grace saved me, right? And, yes. and the key element, and I try to get this through my, my church all the time, is that anything that we do towards God is, is through the Holy Spirit. So when we become a savior and we believe Jesus, it's through the Holy Spirit. And when we believe the stories of the Old Testament, we believe those primarily because of the Holy Spirit. And then we sort of supplement that with any sort of archaeology or evidential based stuff. This to me sounds like it, it's an appeal to presuppositional apologetics. Um, but instead of applying it to a belief in God, you're applying it to the words of scripture. Would, would you say that's an accurate kind of rendition of that? It, there, there definitely is overlap. My current argument of philosophical grounding for standard sacred text is anchored in a Reformed epistemology because both Reformed epistemology and presuppositionalism carry with it a lot of kind of contemporary baggage. I guess if, if I could just put it in this way, I believe that what we need to do when it comes to believing the scripture is that it needs to be a distinctively Christian perspective. Right. which means it is the Bible and the Holy Spirit which should inform our belief in the Bible. I don't think, and the reason why I'm just giving a little bit of pushback yep. is because I don't think... Push, when push someone, away. Push I, away. <laughs> I can take it. I don't it. think I'm, that when I'm somebody like... says, 
you are taking a presuppositional approach because you're deriving what it is to be a husband or what it is to be a father from the Bible. And therefore, you are then going about being a godly husband or a godly father because the Bible is directing you in that way. No one is saying, well, that's a presuppositionalist approach. You need to right. start with Jordan Peterson first, and then you may move to the Bible. Nobody does that. I do get what you're saying, and I think yeah. that there is something to it. I'm not trying to, I'm not, this is me. I'm literally hand waving, but not like hand waving, like <laughs> to get rid of it. That's right. Uh, that's right. The idea is, is that I don't see why even those beliefs that a father or that a husband ought to nourish and cherish his wife, that he ought to love his wife as Christ loved the church, and somehow our belief in the Bible are different than that kind of belief and then only to bottle it up and oh well, this you know this is presuppositional apologetic method or something but at the same time i do see right we're starting with scripture we're starting with the triune god we're starting with yep. christ is lord yes i get that so so there is there is something to that observation i just don't know if, if we can take right in, in totality. You, you wouldn't go all the way so it's it's yeah. i wouldn't say it's totally misrepresenting your position but it is that there's parts of it that don't belong your presentation here uh I'm going to go ahead and plug this book for you, uh, a philosophical grounding of uh, for a sacred standard text. So I ordered this when you said, yes, I would. Uh, and actually, you were kind enough to give me an electronic copy so I wouldn't have to wait for it to come in the mail. Uh, and so in, in reading that, the reason why I kind of come to that uh, thinking is because uh, it, in the beginning chapters, you're talking about the works of Platinga, and he he mentions something called, let's, let's see if I can get it right here. Okay, uh, you're yeah. going to tell me if I get it right. It's the... Uh, uh, census divinitatis. Sure. Is that right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of like an inner witness of the Holy Spirit uh, that, that we have. I wouldn't say inner witness, but that's, that's misrepresentation, but it's, it's a sense that we all have of when God does something or, or a sense that we have that, that God is part of, you know, whatever thing. It gives me the impression of presuppositional apologetics. And then the other question that I have uh, about that uh, census uh, divinitatis, how, how would you differentiate that from something like Mormonism, which talks about an inner witness or a burning bosom? What are your thoughts toward that? So first of all, I think that you're, you, you do, you have touched on something particularly, which is a uh, reformed epistemology would, would arguably, I, I think if you look at the Five Views book on apologetic method, which I had to read for my PhD, we, we would say that reform epistemology would be cousin to the presuppositional method. Right, um, right. But of, of course, not the same. So certainly you're, you're seeing something there. When it comes to the census divinitatis, the census divinitatis, we would draw like straight from Calvin. I mean, if we just want to talk about theological parlance, um, and he, of course, he's not the only one, but obviously within reform traditions, it, it's very much there. The census divinitatis is an innate knowledge of God that we are all born with. Right. Um, it is not directly connected to the Holy Spirit. Planning God doesn't bring in the Holy Spirit until he begins to deal with what he calls his Aquinas Calvin extended model in attempting to show that Christian beliefs are rational and warranted. And in that, he begins to bring in the what he calls the internal instigation or the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit to speak through the words of God to the Christian by faith. In relationship to the burning of the bosom, the first thing that we would say, which is fundamentally different, is the source, the source would be different. The, the leading or speaking of the Holy Spirit is not separate from the Word of God. And so when the Word of God speaks, the Holy Spirit speaks. Second of all, internal testimony of the Holy Spirit is not some kind of uh, spiritual sense. It is a person who is testifying to you through his own testimony via his words of Scripture, right. which can only be received by God-given faith. I think theologically speaking, there would be a significant difference, especially in these particular details. And we would want to drill down further to demonstrate those differences. But it's very much if someone came to you and said, this is what I did for summer break, and you accept their testimony. It is, a, it is that kind of reality. When you read the word of God, the Holy Spirit, a real person, is testifying to you of Christ through the written revelation of scripture. Uh, this is a very personal act. If we bring all of this, the, the census divinitatis and the, the greater things of the gospel. The great things of the gospel. Stuff, yeah, if, yes. we bring, if we bring all that to the table and we plop it right in front of us, how do we relate that to the which TR question? And so what we would ask is, and well, particularly in my philosophical argument, the philosophical argument is to make the case that a person can have rationally warranted belief in their Bible. I don't name a Bible in right. my book. 
but I make a philosophical argument that if someone were to hold to one, they would be both rational and warranted to hold this properly basic belief, right. even if they were incapable of offering significant arguments or significant rebuttals, they would still be both rational and warranted in right. holding that belief. And that, that's the rub when it comes to debates, right? So you could, you could debate the truth and you could debate it horribly and you could come off as the loser in the debate, but it's still the truth regardless of how well you present it. Uh, that seems to be uh, what, what you're saying there. Then if I, if I say, go up onto my shelf here and I grab an NET Bible, and I, and I take what you said, and it's it, I, I would say to myself, this is the one Bible. Why, why would the NET Bible not be the one Bible? In, in one sense, in, in making this philosophical argument, I am, and I want to make this clear, I am calling the bluff, I do believe it's a bluff, uh, mm -hmm. on the part of the critical text side. By making my case, I am not just making the case that if you believe in one, then you're rational and warranted. Part of my case is that you should believe in one. The, the fact is, is it doesn't matter who you put up. I, I watch all your videos with Dr. Gurry and Dr. Hickson. I watch the videos from Dr. Ward. I've read much of Daniel Wallace's work. I read uh, certainly Bart Ehrman. But the idea is, is none of these um, scholars, none of these thinkers, none of these writers hold to one. So by you saying, if I pull the NET off of my shelf and I say, this is the word, in doing that, now I'm, I'm not saying there aren't people who say the ESV is the word of God. Certainly, those people could exist. They very well yeah, do in exist. Fact, I, I would say that uh, just, just about all the critical text scholars, at least the Christian ones, I know there's non-Christian ones, would hold up a plethora of Bibles and say, this is the word of God. Like Mark exactly. Ward would say, this is the word of God, the ESV. And the, I think he's got a whole series where he suggests yeah. that this is a good Bible for certain people in certain situations, right? What I'm doing is I'm, I'm calling that out. I'm saying, I, I don't think that there is um, sufficient warrant to believe that multiple Bibles could be the Bible. Right. But if you do hold to one, so let's let's find that person. So right. I hold to the King James in English as the okay. standard taker text of the English speaking community. Yep. And you hold to the NET, is what you said. Yeah. And so what we would do is, and this is in the end of my book. I'm just using that as an example, actually. No, no, no I don't. I, I got you. I got you. <laughs> What we would do is, is we would first have to recognize that we can't both be right. Um, I, I would invoke the law of non-contradiction non and say that A cannot be A and non-A at the same time and in the same way. So we can't say that the uh, King James Version and the NET are the Word of God at the same time and in the same way. Right. Because they're different enough, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I would say different, period, but let's just let's try to be sure, as judicious sure. as we can. They're different enough. And so as a result, we would both have to understand that either one of us is wrong or we're both wrong, but we certainly can't both be right. And now with that comes a plethora of issues, of things that we have to, that we would have to wrestle with, like we do with anything else. And so I went to school with a bunch of Molinists. I tend to be Calvinistic in my doctrine, in my soteriology. I'm a Reformed Baptist. I baptized by immersion, that's what I believe, but you have Pado baptists uh, The point is, is that we would dispute these things and continue to dispute them. Sure, yeah. And then in the end, it's not going, now I'm going to offer the best arguments I can. I'm going to make historical arguments and evidential arguments. I'm going to make text critical arguments. I'm going to make those arguments. But in the end, I think that the truth of the matter is, is anybody who grows in their, in the knowledge and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, this act of sanctification, shall we say, of the mind, is going to have to be an act of the Holy Spirit. If that is the case, then you're going to read your Bible, I'm going to read my Bible, we're going to meet together, we're going to have coffee, we're going to have these discussions, I'm going to offer my best arguments, you're going to sure, offer your sure. best arguments, and then the Holy Spirit, assuming that we're Christians, we've, we're yielded to the Holy Spirit, we're yielded to the Word, we're yielded to Christ as Lord, will change us. And now we might be, both be wrong and we both go to the ESV. I might be wrong and go to the NET. This is right. possible. But in the end, what doesn't happen, in which I often have experienced holding to the King James Bible, it's, it's happened as early as defending my dissertation. Usually scholars or professors or Joe Schmo on Facebook says, when are you going to get a different Bible? Well, the fact is, is that's none of your business, first of all. Second of all, I have warranted and rational belief in my Bible. Yep. And third of all, if I'm going to change, you're not going to be able to do that by, I guess, bullying me into it. In fact, you can offer your best arguments. I'm allowed to rebut those arguments. Right, right. But in the end, it's going to be the Holy Spirit that's going to guide and direct us. 
rather than some kind of rationalistic argument or evidential argument, or you're compelled to believe this because of some abductive argument, um, I think all of those things fall flat. Right, and so right. that's part of what I was trying. So I wrote the, that little ebook, right? Poking the bear. Then he poked yes, the bear. The yeah. whole point was is to stir the pot. I don't consider it a scholarly work. I consider yeah, it I a, a work to to kind of, I don't, I don't know if you've ever done this before. I've When I was a kid, there was huge uh, hornet's nest on our walk to school. So we went and whacked it with a stick. Oh, um, sure. Yeah. And so it was fun. I went, none of us got stung, but you know, there was the excitement. Um, <laughs> it's kind of what I'm shooting for with that particular work yeah, is to begin cool. to point these things out and ask that, that we think about them again. Right, and, right. and the way to do that is, is basically by Maybe, right. maybe, as, a, as Socrates says, be the gadfly on the horse that is Greece. So then if, if we consider like the move of the Holy Spirit in the individual person, I, I, I'm, I'm from a Pentecostal background, so sure. I, I, I might say things in a very Pentecostal way. <laughs> Actually, I pastor a Pentecostal church. Um, so if, if the Holy Spirit moves in us uh, to make us believe something, uh, he, he changes our heart, he does that work, and he, he convicts us of sin, and, and, and he does a work in our life, and, and our life produces fruit. Okay, so we're walking around as Christians and in, in the power of God to do righteousness and we're sharing our faith and, and uh, spreading the word of the gospel and, and bringing converts into the body. Um, but we use an ESV. So how is it that the Holy Spirit works in this function, um, but then doesn't convince the person of, of the Bible translation they're using? This is a, this is a standard um, Roman Catholic argument that was used in the Reformation. Okay. which is you Lutherans believe one thing and you Presbyterians or your Calvinists, you believe another thing. And we Roman Catholics, we believe another thing. And what the Roman Catholics did is they used that argument to say, how is it that the Protestant Reformation can be led by the Holy Spirit? You guys don't even agree among yourselves. And the response to this is, is that the Holy Spirit does not sanctify the church at the same time, nor does he sanctify the individual to the same degree. Right. And so you can have a person who is very much mature spiritually in one in one aspect and very much a child, spiritually speaking, in another. That ultimately, I guess, as kind of a basic treatment, is the answer to that. So you right, have right. someone who's going out doing the Lord's work, using the ESV. To the degree that the ESV represents the original language and therefore carries with it the substantia doctrina of the original language, yep. it, the Holy Spirit is present to those words. Uh, to the degree that it is not, or to the degree that it is omitting God's words, then the Holy Spirit is not present with that work. And, and for me, this is, is not a leap because um, certainly all you have to have is a track. You don't need a whole Bible. Go and take one track, hand it to somebody that has the Romans Road in it, for example. Right, right. And that's all the Bible you would need for the Holy Spirit to speak through and to change that person's life. Right. Certainly in the first century, you had First Thessalonians. You didn't have Second Thessalonians yet. Did you have the Bible? Yes. Did you have the canon? No. But could you still lead someone to the Lord? Yes. The incomplete nature of the text, as long as there's text present does not preclude the working of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm.